I'm Carol Ann Riddell and this is Science and You. We begin today with the king of butterflies. The monarch is immediately recognizable by its striking orange and black markings. But scientists say this iconic creature could be at risk with an alarming decline in its population. What can you do to help? More than you might think. The monarch butterfly is one of nature's wonders. Its migration pattern spans thousands of miles and multiple generations, fascinating scientists and devoted fans along the way. But this grand butterfly is in trouble. An environmentalist, Peter Schmidt of Queens College, is determined to do something about it. He explains the monarch population has plummeted. At this point, it's less than 10% of what we, what we know is its peak population uh, in the last 40 years. The first question that comes to mind is why? Schmidt, who is director of the Metropolitan Monarch Alliance, says a big part of the problem is habitat loss. Monarchs rely on milkweed plants, which humans may consider simply weeds. Herbicides used in agriculture can kill the plants. And extreme weather and climate change may also be factors. But there are things we can do. People can help by planting milkweed plants. They lay their eggs on these plants, and that's the only thing the babies will eat, the caterpillars will eat, is milkweed. Luckily for the monarchs, there's 200 different species of uh, milkweed scattered all across the United States, but we've systematically removed it. And Schmidt is getting the word out. We visited one of his seminars at the Queen's Botanical Garden. He's working with teachers and community members, giving something of a crash course on monarch butterflies. From life cycle to conservation, he covers it all with unbridled enthusiasm, creating an army of citizen scientists who can help spread understanding and action. We're going to plant those milkweed plants in our garden. Mm -hmm. And the hope is that they'll come back or they'll lay eggs. And this is something that we're gonna start that's not just one season long. This is something that potentially could be happening for years to come. A monarch just really kind of sparks the imagination. Hey, help me. Schmidt's passion for insects, and the monarch in particular, seems to be contagious. He and his kids have been known to pull over on the highway when they spot milkweed. My two 14-year-old boys can 60 miles an hour in the LIE, dad, dad, milkweed, and we pull over, stop, check it out. We find caterpillars, we find eggs, it's fun. Getting and keeping kids excited about science can be a challenge, but an impressive program that spans 20 scientific institutions across New York City is doing just that by giving high school students the opportunity to do real research in the labs of actual scientists. Donna Hanover has more. It's such a dry region that these bears are definitely looking for water. So this is our study system. Here's California. And then this is Lake Tahoe, that lake. And those orange dots are some of the 2013 bear locations, not all. Dr. Ray Wynn Grant is a conservation biologist at the American Museum of Natural History. Omari Romaine and Brielle Randall are high schoolers who've been doing research with her on conflict between humans and bears. So you guys you came up with this data. This is from Geoplaner. Oh. You know, all those Geoplaner addresses you put in? Oh, yeah. The museum has run its science research mentoring project, affectionately known as SHRIMP, since about 2009, bringing in high school students to actually do scientific research. And in the last few years, 19 other institutions around New York have joined in to form a consortium of science research mentoring programs. Dr. Preeti Gupta, the lead facilitator, says the students all take some initial courses. They learn how to use uh, lab materials, uh, run gels, for example, uh, do some stats work that they might need, and then they can apply for a position working alongside scientists. If you're interested in engineering, you might think of Hypothecids, or you might think of the uh, NYU Poly program. Or if you're interested in uh, the health sciences, we have the Columbia Brainiacs program, which is on neuroscience, the Mount Sinai program, um, and several more. The scientists welcome these particular students into their lab because they are prepared. They've taken the coursework. They know how to read scientific articles. That doesn't mean they don't have to train them. They do. But in that training, they know that students already have a strong foundation. So they love having them in the lab. One purpose is to attract to STEM fields, science, technology, engineering, and math, historically underrepresented students. Maybe they're low income, and maybe they don't have resources in their neighborhoods and schools to do this kind of work. And 
and kids get a stipend for their work, so it's essentially a part-time job. And the kind of work they do is not just cleaning beakers. The scientists are having them take a piece of that investigation that the scientist is working on and, and own it. I have my two students working on a brand new data set that I have never myself analyzed. The students take it very seriously. I am always indebted to them in terms of the effort they put in and what I can give back. Omari Romain says working for Dr. Wynn Grant is amazing. She always has a positive vibe to her when you come into the office, always willing to hear about your day. So like me, a high school student, she wants to know about me and she does all this important, cool science stuff. We were really interested when we found out she was going to Madagascar. Um, it was really, really excited. And students sometimes bring skills beyond science to the research projects. Did you make these? Yeah, I made them yesterday. You did? For sure they'll go in our presentation. What do the students' friends and families think? Yeah, they're very proud of me for doing this. Meanwhile, over in another building, students working under Dr. Emre Bartos of Columbia University are doing research on gravitational waves being studied at LIGO, which stands for Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory. We have to find a better way of explaining um, LIGO's laser interferometry system. Yeah, yeah. yeah, to like talk about how the apex divides the two beams of light and reflects it back. We have to mention how it's interference patterns. Yeah, but we also have to like mention the strain data. Remember, we got to explain what strain is, because sometimes, even when Imre is explaining it, I forget yeah. what it is. <laughs> yeah, strain right, data. You mentioned how it changes everything fractionally. Do you plan to go into science? Yeah, I do. So I want to go into astrophysics, and the reason why is because I feel like it's really an unexplored field of science. Yeah. And do you think this work here is going to help you? Yeah, for sure, because Imre ba like, basically teaches me about what it is to be a physicist. Abraham Deraval credits his mom with searching online and finding the museum ASP after school program that led to working with Dr. Bartos. I applied to shrimp and thankfully I got in, as you can see, and all of my friends got in as well. I remember doing homework for ASP and scientists had just discovered the gravitational wave signal and I had no idea that a couple months later when I joined shrimp I would be working with a scientist who actually collaborated with the Lager Group in their discovery. What happens after these programs? First of all, they have a resume that is so rich that once they apply for colleges, that becomes the thing that they talk about most when they're in their interviews. Once they're in college and they decide they want to pursue the sciences and they talk to their professors that they did this kind of research as a high school student, the professor opens the door for them. There are so many um, People who have gone into graduate school have gotten their PhDs, and they do credit it back to their experience in the high school program. I know I want to be either an engineer or an astrophysicist, and I thought this program would really tell me what an astrophysicist does in a laboratory, and I get that experience to make my decision. Good decision to come here? Mm -hmm. Oh, definitely. Students, teachers, and parents who want to know more should check out the website studentresearchnyc.org. Already, the Science Research Mentoring Consortium has enabled hundreds of students like these to consider careers related to science, technology, engineering, and math. And that benefits us all. I'm Donna Hanover for Science and You. And here now to tell us a little bit more is Cynthia Malone, a graduate of the program herself. Thanks so much for coming in, Cynthia. Thank you for having me. So before we talk about the program, tell us a little bit about what you're doing now. I know you're still in science. It sounds like you're doing some very interesting stuff. Sure, so I'm based at the American Museum of Natural History, and the American Museum of Natural History, in addition to the fabulous exhibitions that they have, have an extensive, extensive amount of research departments in the background. Sure, yeah. So I work in the Center for Biodiversity and Conservation, which works on convening and connecting knowledge about biodiversity to actual action on the ground. Oh, very cool. And there, I manage our programs in the Solomon Islands. Wow, so you were saying recently you were just there, correct? Yes, I actually just came back in April. Mm -hmm. And usually my work takes me to work with the Solomon Islands Community Conservation Partnership, or SICCP. 
and they're based in Honiara, which is the capital of the Solomon Islands, but they work with island-based conservation groups around the Solomon Islands. So I help them with capacity development, strategic planning, as well as just thinking about different strategies for natural resource management. Okay, super impressive, but take me back to your teenage self. Sure. How important was this program in terms of getting you to where mm. you are now? Absolutely essential. So I was one of those kind of interesting kids that knew exactly what I wanted to do from the time that I could speak. Wow. Yes. So I would draw pictures of orangutans. I would give <laughs> little speeches to my stuffed animals, which I would line up and talk about primate conservation. Oh my gosh, I love this. Watching nature shows. So I always knew that I wanted to be a conservation scientist and I was obsessed with Jane Goodall. So when I was in high school, I was you know, obsessively looking into different programs in the city that would allow me to engage with that work. And I came across the shrimp program at the American Museum and eagerly applied and history from there. There you go. So was this your real sort of first exposure to this truly as a career option? Hmm. Yes, it was. It was. So my family, my mom, my dad, immediate family, they didn't graduate from college, even though I had a great uncle who was a zoologist and I would hear stories about how he would keep alligators in the bathtub. <laughs> <laughs> but in my immediate family, there wasn't this um, expectation around, you know, graduate school or college. So I just kind of had this fascination and being at the American Museum was my first exposure to real life scientists sure. who are doing you know, work around the world on both studying species as well as conserving them. And I gotta imagine that that hands-on piece of it, working with real scientists, is so meaningful at that age. Yes, totally. And the great thing about the shrimp program is before you're actually paired with a scientist, we had to spend time taking courses. So I was exposed to ornithology, which is the study of birds. I was exposed to ethology, the study of fish. I was exposed to just general concepts and genetics. And we had a year of taking those classes before we were actually paired with mentors doing science. So you're really ready by the time you walk in. Exactly. You know, we hear so much about the need to encourage kids in science to make it attainable, especially for girls. Mm -hmm. Was it important for you to have role models, people you could see? Totally. So while I was doing the program, I was paired with a fellow young woman in science. Um, and we both were working with Sasha Spector, who was working on dung beetle conservation. And that was awesome because he really encouraged us to apply some of the scientific knowledge around dung beetle species to actually conserving them. But also working with Sasha Spector was a young woman scientist named mm. Liz Nichols, and she was a dung beetle scientist as well. So seeing her was kind of like my first exposure right. to a woman who was doing yeah. this amazing, incredible work. Which is really terrific, and I'm sure it's very meaningful. Yes. But particularly as a young person, as mm -hmm. a teenager, mm -hmm. which is what you were at that point. Totally. Um, so just a, a last question for you. Some advice that you would give to other young people, to teenagers right now who might want to get into the sciences as you have. I would say don't be afraid to go out there and contact people that you're interested in working with or people that you could see yourself becoming someday. I think oftentimes um, young women, particularly young women of color in the sciences, it's difficult because you don't see people that are necessarily like you doing the work that you want to do. So don't be afraid. If somebody's doing research that you're interested in, just contact them. Either have a conversation or maybe they have something that you could particularly, that you could actually join in on and contribute to in some way. So don't be afraid to build your network early and grab onto any opportunity that comes your way. Great advice. All right, Cynthia, thank you so much for coming in and best of luck to you. Thank you so much. Who discovered penicillin? Watson and Crick, Sir Alexander Fleming, Robert Koch, or Louis Pasteur? That's right, Sir Alexander Fleming discovered penicillin by accident. While returning to a messy lab after going on vacation, Fleming noticed some mold that formed, penicillin notatum, which prevented the normal growth of Staphylococcus, a harmful bacteria he'd been studying. Squeezed between skyscrapers are tucked away spaces that have been abandoned for decades, just waiting for some imagination to take root. And it has. Plans are now underway for the world's first underground park, which will use new technology to light up these concrete canyons of New York City. Tina Beth Pina has a story. The Low Line Project is a uh, project uh, envisioned by Dan Brash and James Ramsey. The idea is to take a cutting edge solar technology which delivers natural sunlight 
to places in underground park uh, in an abandoned trolley station in the Lower East Side. In September 2012, the Low Line team built a full-scale prototype of their solar technology in an empty warehouse on Essex Street in the Lower East Side called Low Line Lab. The team, which is a collaboration of various specialists, tested and showcased how the solar system can sustain plant life in an underground environment. At the Low Line Lab, we have installed active solar harvesting system, which includes a bunch of different components in order to gather direct sunlight, redirect it, concentrate it, and distribute it uh, underground or at a great remote distance. These solar harvesting systems are a little complex, but to state it simply, they have three major components. There's the heliostat, which is a mirror that tracks the sun as it moves across the sky, thus making sure the solar collectors are taking an even amount of sunlight throughout the day. Second, there's the collimator, which is a giant parabolic mirror that redirects the sunlight into one concentrated beam of light. Lastly, the heliotubes, which are fiber optic cables that channel the concentrated beam to its final destination. There are active solar harvesting and passive solar harvesting techniques. Passive solar harvesting is like skylights and windows and ley lights and things that we see uh, all over the built environment and we know that they work. The reason for the lab is this active solar harvesting technology that, that where we're tracking the sun is something that is not used very much because it has moving pieces and it varies depending on where it is that we needed to test to make sure that it would work. In order to test this solar sensing equipment, the Low Line team installed three active solar harvesting systems with different types of lenses inside to collect the different amounts of sunlight. The next question for the team is where and how to disperse the light. One of them we wanted to shoot straight down so it would be high intensity sunlight right in the middle of the lab so we'd get, be able to put uh, edibles in there, herbs, high light plants. One of the technology units we kind of, which collected the same amount of light, we dispersed it a little bit more so we'd have greater coverage of sunlight but less intense so we'd be able to plant like medium level light plants. The unit that collected the least amount of sunlight, we dispersed it a lot to get a lot of coverage and use that area to plant a lot of low light plants that we would be comfortable in, in surviving. The more that we can create an environment similar to the actual plant's native habitat, the more likely it will be to thrive and, and succeed in the way that we'd like it to. To achieve this goal, the landscape designers not only needed to consider the amount of sunlight they could get from the solar system, but also the durations of the light, the airflow, the humidity level, and one big environmental factor for plants to grow, temperature. We selected a range where the minimum temperature would be 50 and the maximum temperature would be about 85. The challenge is that the amount of uh, humidity in the space is not what you would expect in a tropical climate. So it's a lower humidity. We had to kind of supplement and make sure we didn't use plants that are really dependent on high humidity. After careful consideration, the team chose over 60 varieties of plants for the first installation. By the end of the year and a half the lab was in existence, the selections increased to over 160 varieties. They vary from edibles such as strawberries, herbs like basil, sage, rosemary, and then of course more common houseplant or standard interior plants, tropical understory plantings. So there's really a very wide variety. Um, plants from the desert, um, plants from the rainforest, it really runs the gamut. Constrained by time and budget, the low line decided to water the plants manually and self-pollinate in the lab. However, the low line team is looking for an alternative solution in the long run that includes an automatic irrigation system and ventilation system to better control the environment. I think in general the plants did better than we anticipated because the light was more effective than had been projected. And so we were able to actually get higher foot candles than uh, we understood originally. And we had about a 90 to 92 and a half percent success rate for those plants, um, which is well above industry standard. So definitely a success in sustaining plant life. There were some other fruits that we attempted in there, in the lab. Raspberries did, did quite well, although they weren't in there long enough to fruit. 
We tried some citrus varieties. We grew strawberries, which were successful. We actually got to eat them. The success of the lab proves that the solar technology can work, and it also received a lot of positive feedback from the community. This um, future project does resonate with the community. And we are uh, right now going through about a year-long series of meetings, workshops, charrettes, open public forums, where we are asking community members, community board members, people who uh, run certain nonprofits in the Lower East Side, all spectrums of people of engagement in the community, what they would like to see uh, in the low line. What can it do for them? And how can it be a space that is, is positive? I think we can start to really get a lot of young people and old people excited about the opportunities of science and space and the future of our built environment and maybe start to pursue and think about the world and the opportunities that we have in the world in a different way because they see something which seemed like a crazy idea which we're making into a reality. The proposed one acre site rethinks the way we bring light and science into dark and abandoned spaces. The Low Line Park is projected to officially open in 2021, right here under my feet at the former site of the Williamsburg Bridge Trolley Terminal. For Science and You, I'm Tina Betfinia. Just think about it. So many of the products in our homes started out as concepts in a lab, but bringing those products to market and ultimately to your door involves lots of research. Our Andrew Falzone went halfway across the country to the world's biggest home and housewares trade show to learn about some pretty cool products and the science behind them. Each year, the International Home and Houseware Show sets up shop in Chicago, and this year, Science and You made it all the way out to the Windy City to try and find home products that have some science in them. Walking through the International Home and Houseware Show is like walking through the crossroads of the world's best known brands. Everything from home dry cleaning to better baking to a cleaner house is on display. If you want to pretty up your home and grow some herbs and veggies in the process, one product is taking a centuries old science and bringing it to your kitchen. So the Aero Garden is the world's number one countertop garden and what it lets you do is grow lettuce, tomatoes, herbs. We're even growing baby pumpkins in our lab. Almost anything you want to grow indoors year round. John Thompson is one of Arrow Garden's co inventors. The product uses the concept of hydroponics, which is growing plants without using dirt. Even though hydroponics has been around since the 1600s, Arrow Garden's goal was to produce a product that was family friendly and easy to use. The roots are actually growing down, sprouting, growing out into air. So they're taking oxygen out of the air, kind of like our lungs do, growing much faster. And then they're growing down into a nutrient bath. Essentially, that's giving them exactly what they need, exactly the right amount of calcium, iron, magnesium, all the vitamins that us carbon-based life forms need to grow and, and flourish. And of course, to complete photosynthesis, plants need light, but not just any light. The LED grow lights, we've custom-tuned the spectrum to be exactly what plants need to maximize photosynthesis. If you try to go under an incandescent light, it's, plants are getting almost none of the light they need to, to photosynthesize. Cleaning up around the house is never fun unless you're not the one doing it. Nita Robotics has been selling automated vacuums since 2010. Company CEO Giacomo Marini is one of Silicon Valley's superstars, having co-founded Logitech. Marini is by trade a computer engineer with a keen insight into how humans and technology interact. And we see the emotional reaction of people that are either very happy when the robot does the right thing for them and also get, get quite upset if, we, if the robot does not behave exactly as they expect. And anyone who's ever seen a robot vacuum in action has wondered how the little machine knows where it's going. Turns out each Neato vacuum is also a map maker. So the basic technology that we build our robot on is based on laser mapping. We have a turret on top of the robot. Uh, where the, a spinning laser uh, maps the environment around it and builds a representation, an accurate representation of the room, of the space that the robot is present in. That map also helps the Nido determine the most efficient path to use while cleaning and it helps avoid major obstacles. The laser technology is cutting edge. So the laser spins, spins uh, five rotations a second and so, and uh, during that, continuously build a map 
uh, in real time. It's called Simultaneous Localization and Mapping, SLAM, and it's the same technology that is used in most of the self-driving vehicles. The Google car has a, has a uh, SLAM unit on top of the car that contains 64 lasers. We have only one instead of 64. One of Nito's less high-tech features is a squared front end it calls Clever Corner technology. It allows the Nito to clean in corners where a circular robot can't reach. The Nito also has an undermounted sensor that prevents it from getting too close and plummeting down a flight of steps. But locating the laser turret in the back of the robot has had a huge impact on its functionality. So you can see that a foundational navigational technology allows us to build a much better robot that becomes much more powerful, a much bigger brush, much bigger dirt bin, and, uh, and uh, a larger battery pack. So something that makes overall a much better robot vacuum. And the newest product models from Nito and AeroGarden are internet enabled to keep you connected to your cleaning and growing. Now the wine wand from Pure Wine isn't connected to the internet, but it may help you avoid wine allergies. You may be drinking wine and all of a sudden you start feeling bad the next day. People call it a hangover. And a lot of those problems are not from overconsumption. Like many of us, Dr. David Meadows loves a good glass of wine. Meadows has a Ph.D. in biomedical engineering from the University of Michigan and spent nearly 20 years as the head of research and development for Alcon Labs, a division of pharmaceutical company Novartis. And so what we've been able to identify is that it's some of the other ingredients that are in the wine. And that was really what we call cracking the code, of being able to demythologize everyone's explanation for that. So the reaction that some people have to wine is less of a hangover and more of an allergy to two ingredients. For those who react to white wine, the offending chemical is a sulfite. In red wine, the problematic ingredients are histamines, compounds that occur naturally in grapes and get released when they get mashed up. Luckily, neither ingredient affects how the wine tastes. 95% of the histamines and sulfites are able to be removed and only 2% of these other ingredients are removed from the wine. So the next time you have something to do around the house, you might be able to do it better with a little help from science. I'm Andrew Falzone for Science and You. And that's our show for today. Thanks for joining us. I'm Carol Ann Riddell. We'll see you next time on Science and You.